and welcome to the Business of Property Podcast. I'm Simon. And I'm Stuart. We've been finding, buying and growing income from property for over 20 years and we talk every week about the reality of running property businesses. Before we get into the topic for today, we would really like it if you could leave us a rating or even better, a review. We really do appreciate them and they really do help people discover the Business of Property podcast and hopefully bring property into their lives. So this week, we thought we'd talk a little bit about some property problems or property sort of business and property portfolio problems. Stuart and I talk to lots of lots of landlords in our, our day-to-day lives, and there are, are some sort of common themes that are uh, come out of these conversations. So, so we thought we'd we share some of them and talk through what could potentially be done to, to sort of help improve these situations. So where we're going to start today is is quite a, a well, I say quite, I think this is a very, very common situation. And this is where you've got a, an experienced landlord who's been building a portfolio over time. And they've ended up with quite a mixed portfolio. So they might have a buy to let because maybe they they started there or they're sort of an accidental landlord style they they kept their old property or something but then they've been tempted into something else and they've thought oh I'm, maybe I'll have a, a commercial property that that would be be a, a much more reliable income so now they've got a, a buy to let property and a commercial property and and then they they maybe think oh perhaps perhaps serviced accommodation or or some other style will be a better business for the future or something that they want to build. And then they, they go down that route. And and after five years, 10 years of being in property, they might end up with sort of a couple of buy to lets, a, a, a shop that there's a, a commercial property, and and then something else. Maybe maybe it's a service accommodation, maybe it's an HMO, or or maybe it's some, some land that they want to develop, or, or all sorts of possible mixed portfolios. And, and they're sort of sat there with all these properties and thinking, well, these are all very different businesses. What, what should I do? Should I keep running all of these different businesses? Or should I sort of rethink things, rethink the business as a whole? And, and yeah, what, what do you feel about that, Stuart? Well, the first question I have is, um, it, it is... Why, why is that a problem? So we so say we come into property to create wealth, and um, you know. So okay, so I've, I've started building a property business. And I've got all these things. I've got buy to lets. I've got a commercial property. And I've got land. Why is that a problem? Well, my my point of view, my, my opinion on this is that it's a it's a problem because of what you just talked about. Is that you're firstly running lots of different businesses. That's that's. Uh, challenge number one. Why is that a problem? Because you have to have many different disciplines and think about many different things. And I think this is part of it, and this is not a problem we'd actually listed, but part of the problem is that we, most of us, come from different sectors, different backgrounds. And for some reason, we come into a new sector, e.g. property, and then try and do loads of different strands within that thing. And so for me, it's about it really comes down fundamentally down to almost task switching, which is trying to do lots of different things and knowing lots of different things, because I I will quite happily put my hand in the air. And, you know, if I'm speaking with someone, they ask me about a, a commercial to residential development, I'll say, yeah, I'm not your guy. Now, I can talk about the principles of finance. I can talk about how you're funding it. And there is a part of me that knows that I would understand it because, um, yeah, there's lots of things I do understand through property, but it's a very different animal to doing a buff and fluff on a one bedroom flat buy to let, uh, as is serviced accommodation. And, and I'm experiencing that myself because I have lots of, uh, you know, rooms, we have a buy to let and I have a serviced accommodation. Now managing the serviced accommodation takes a very different set of skills and not time and knowledge than it does to, manage rooms as it does to just have someone in a flat for, for two years that uh, I only hear from once in a blue moon. 
So that's why that's a problem. So I just wanted to underscore that because that's what we're talking about. Because you might go, well, actually, having all those things, surely that's a good thing. Yeah, I mean, you, you could say it's, it's diversification. It, it's spreading your risk. So yeah, may, maybe it is good. But I think really the, the problem comes when you're one person and you're trying to do all of these things and you've, you've just got limited time. And I mean, maybe you've got a day job as well. And it, it, you only have a certain amount, a certain quota of time to dedicate to your property business. And, and hence, you have to kind of choose what you're going to focus on. Because as you say, they're, they're such different businesses. Running a service accommodation business is so, so different from a buy-to-let, for example, not, not least in what you need to do on a day-to-day basis, but also in terms of the amount of effort that's required. Mm. So, and, so yeah. you know, I, I have you know, a mix that I've just talked through, some of which I employ people, person, directly, others I outsource. So it's not that I'm even doing it necessarily all of it myself, but it still requires that mental change and, and and as you say i agree i think it's fine if you ended up at the end of your investment journey in 20 25 years time and you have that mix i don't think there's any problem with that whatsoever what we're talking about is most people you know uh, and i say when i say early on i mean first five ten years is that they do that they have this smorgasbord of properties and it's called shiny. People call it shiny penny syndrome. That you know, that, that they look over there and they see something that, like you just said, and it looks really interesting, but it always distracts us from the very thing. I like to just remind people because shiny penny syndrome sounds really nice. What it really means is lack of focus. It means you're not focused on the things that are most important. And yeah, yeah, this leads us into actually the problem. The second problem, number two. So you know, first problem that we encounter lots is that people have a lot of different things going on. And I personally spoke with someone very recently that had the issues that Simon's just outlined. They actually had some really good. They you know property with land on it. They'd split the titles. They'd buy to lets. All of that going on. But uh, and actually in this occasion they did have a, a clear. Well, they had an objective. But the problem that leads most of us, because I'm, I'm including myself in this, because I did exactly the same, by the way, for the first year and a half until I you know, slapped myself around in the face and realized that I just needed to focus, was a clear vision and a strategy. And that can sound really grand, but it's not really. Um, but we do need to dig into that a little bit because a vision, a vision is required because we need to know where we're going to get to. Because yeah, if we've got a vision of, I, I just want to build a portfolio of X size to bring me X income. We can do, we can skin that cat in so many different ways that it hasn't really answered the question. So what is the vision? And I, I said this to some, you know, someone actually, I met with someone, you know, face to face and said, you know, what is it you want? Well, I said, what's your vision? And they said, well, I want to own X number of properties. And I said, that's not a vision. That That's just an objective, right? So, we don't have to be grand about it, but we do need to, have to sort of put some detail into what it is we want to achieve. And the reason a vision is important, because without the vision, you can't build a strategy, which is, again, another a grand word, because there's, strategies and plans are very different. For me, strategy is just a little bit further thinking, and then we need a plan to execute the strategy. Um, but until we've got that vision, we have, we have no strategy. So if I wanted to stay involved in a customer service industry, which, and that's why I do quite like service accommodation, then I'd think about building out that business. If, you know, depending on what my vision was, I might, you know, follow, you know, Simon's path and just, you know, have buy to lets that are quite hands off, but deliver a bit of income. So, so vision and strategy for me are very, very important to mitigate some of the other issues that we've just talked about in terms of having lots of different things going on. Indeed. So when people sort of find themselves in this situation where they haven't had a very clear vision or, and or strategy and they've, they, they've ended up following shiny pennies all over the place and, and have now got a collection of, of things, what, what do you think people might want to consider doing to, to improve that situation? My, my view is, is very simple. It's you need to take yourself away, take yourself out of the business, out of the house, go and sit in a coffee shop, cup of coffee, put any electronic devices away, get a blank sheet of paper and try and really get to what it is you really want to build. 
in term and that is you, you know a key and and funny enough because it it does kind of lead us on to um you know you know one of the one of our, ne- uh, our next problems but getting just sitting down and getting that time to think about what it is i want now the the, the next problem that, that is mixed into this is that and again you know if we if we ask people what they want from property i, I could almost guarantee 90 percent of people will say freedom uh, and again i was in that i am in that bucket so people will say freedom they will say legacy um you know it, it, it could income but those words cover so much ground that we haven't really articulated to ourselves what it is we want to do so again this is coming from a place of experience because I used to, that word used to annoy the hell out of me because I always say, I just want freedom. I just want freedom. But what did that mean? So I had to start digging into what that meant. It meant financial freedom. It meant that I could work when I wanted to work. It meant I had flexibility around work. Uh, It also meant that I would be trying to cover my existing salary that I was getting at the time. So already I've built sort of a bit of a picture of what it was. I wanted flexibility in life because we, again, we've talked about this on previous episodes. There's no point in building, you know, something and then you suddenly realize, oh, this, this doesn't suit me at all. And I would say, you know, I looked for flexibility in property. I had probably equal amounts of flexibility, if not maybe a little bit less on occasion because I had to go out of the house more often. So maybe I didn't tick that box. Yeah, exactly. Yes. You, you can end up building yourself a new job, really, can't you? If you're if you're not careful, and as you say, I think when you're when you're going away and thinking about what you really want, it's it's important to to look at what you're doing and what what you enjoy. What not just do you want freedom, but what does freedom look like? As in, does it mean you just have enough money in the bank that you can always sit on a beach, or would that be boring? Would freedom actually be that you can carry on working and doing what you want to do, but but just without needing to worry about um, whether you lost that job. So, so maybe you, you still want to have a job and you still want that freedom to work in a day job. So you don't want your property to, to take up much time, but you want that freedom to not have to worry about potentially losing that job or needing to change the job or whatever. So maybe it doesn't actually mean stopping work. It's yeah. There's lots of different definitions of freedom, and I think uh, if that's even what you want to do or achieve. Um, so yeah, I think there's. It's always worth, uh, as you say, having a blank sheet of paper and thinking about what it is that you enjoy, what it is that you you like doing in your your property business or in life generally, and how you can re-engineer things to to better achieve that. Yeah, and and just for a tip for anyone that is thinking about doing this or, or for themselves, I would say. A lot of us know what we don't want. It's, it's, we find it very hard to articulate what we do want, but we, we, well, I don't like this and I don't like that. Start there and do write down the opposite. That's what I tend to do if I'm, if I'm really struggling. The other part of that is we just talked about things like legacy as well. And in the examples we'd given before, where people have, again, they've got this smorgasbord of property, but not only that, they've got these mixed ownership, ownership structures. And again, I'm very guilty of this because I own properties in limited company in personal names and also with other people so joint ventures so there's a lot of that going and so when people talk about legacy uh and as someone i met with very recently uh, and i'm going to give you a shout out michael hello michael um he had done a lot of groundwork a lot of groundwork in terms of uh you know, power of attorneys, writing wills for, for his partner and himself and, you know, thinking about all of that. Now, I am extremely guilty of not, I have not done any of that. So I am not prepared for these things. Um, but when people talk about legacy, I would say that probably 80%, if I'm using the Pareto principle, 80% probably haven't thought about, what, again, what that actually means. And I'm sure there's a lot of people that have, but thinking about inheritance tax planning, you know, if, if we are thinking about legacy, are the properties structured in such a way that there is lack of, you know, that, that we are making ourselves as tax efficient as possible to pass those properties on? But again, I, I think what a lot of us are, we get quite short sighted um, because, because we, we get in, we roll our sleeves up and we get busy and that's good. But we're not doing those structural things. And so the example of the person I spoke with, another person I spoke with recently, they had the same thing and and that, that had complicated matters. And they 
to simplify, they were now looking at spending X thousands of pounds to get personal properties into the limited company structure. Now, I'm, pers- I'm not going to get into the detail of that, but I, I did look at that myself as well. But the, the essentially the effort and cost outweighed the benefit. In fact, there was negligible benefit. So I just thought I'm going to live with it. Obviously, there might be tax benefits depending on your size of property, size of portfolio, the value of the property and so on. But the point we're making here is that if you do that on day zero, (laughs) you don't have to worry about any of this because you've already started to build the thing the way you want to to build it in in the in to reach your objectives and goals, whatever they are. Yeah, yeah, quite on on the on the moving properties around uh, conversation. That's that's a a very complex process, um, almost certainly involving uh, tax and, as you say, expenses and fees and and what have you. So, yeah, I think I think there's always something to consider very carefully, and also uh, get get very uh, very firm professional advice <laughs> in that particular area because that is very complicated. Yeah, but if if you conclude that you can't sort of easily move properties around, because this is one of the big problems with property is that it's it's very illiquid. So you build up this portfolio and, and you've got lots of different things doing, doing different styles of businesses. And, and you've now decided you want to simplify life and you are a little bit stuck with, with what you can do because you could sell properties and and indeed that that's a way to actually move effectively move properties into a business is you can sell personal name ones and then buy again in in a business. And you can, you can use that opportunity to actually uh, improve the properties that you've got or, or choose properties that you're you're happier with potentially but and, and so sort of if you just decide you don't want to go down the buy to let route anymore you want to focus on service accommodation for example you need to get rid of those buy to let properties and and that is a difficult task and to some extent expensive as well but maybe another option would be if you don't want to be dealing with things, and this might work sort of the other way around more, if you don't, if you've got service accommodation property that you own and you don't want to go through the effort of selling it, as you mentioned earlier, Stuart, perhaps another approach is that you you focus more on outsourcing these these elements of your business that you you don't want to be so involved with anymore. So you could take on a, an agent to run that, and there are lots of different levels of agents as well. So you might already have an agent that that handles the cleaning for you and the general maintenance or something. But maybe you need an agent that will actually handle all of the processes. They'll handle the, the bookings, the listings online, the um, checking in of people, checking out of people. And of course, on top of that, the cleaning and the maintenance and things. So, so yeah, may, maybe that's another approach to sort of refashioning your property business and, and reshaping it into something that you're happier with. I, I don't know how... How do you feel? Do you feel that's a, a valid approach, Stuart? Or do you think actually you're just making yourself another different kind of job that you maybe don't really want? No, I don't think so. Again, if it aligns with your, your vision of your strategy. And for me personally, if you're looking yeah, if you're looking for greater time freedom, but you know, you would outsource it. And you know, and obviously, yeah, I think most people know about using letting agents. So I think that's that's pretty straightforward. And on this point. The one I'm going to just squeeze in another problem is the unknown unknowns. And what I mean by that is because what we're talking about is that a lot of us come from different sectors, said this before, and just think that we're going to know everything. And and why, why does that become a problem? And so this is me saying we should do some form of education, whether that's listening to podcasts, you know, reading as many books as possible. I think there's a huge amount of value out there that you can get for free as well as doing yes yeah, so definitely when the rubber meets the road and we've always said that you, you can probably learn as much from buying a buy to let as as you know doing a course but i would definitely you know advise on on some form of education but so for example another person i spoke to recently they had a commercial property and they had spent um and i'm just going to make these numbers up to protect the innocent they had let's say they spent uh, 70 thousand pounds and the property was now valued at let's say, uh, let's just say £100,000. So they, so they bought property basically in cash and increased the value to 100000 Now, the person said to me that they were going to sell this property 
because it wasn't uh, working for them. Although all the cash flow, so it was it was rented, it was generating rental income, um, but the person I was speaking with said it doesn't make any money. And I said, but you you are making money. Actually, you're making profit every month because you have no mortgage, um, and because it's a commercial property, everything's being covered for you. So yeah, I, I'm sure there's some some costs in there somewhere. But uh, but they said yes, but you know I, I put in yeah you know, seventy thousand pounds into this business to buy this property and I don't, I don't have that money. So in their mind, so they, so they didn't actually have the, the investment uh, mindset, which was, okay, so actually I've got 70,000 pounds. And again, I'm using simple maths. These, these are not accurate numbers, but a thousand pounds a month. So I'm getting 12,000 a year. So I actually, uh, yeah, for my 70,000 pounds that I've put into this property, I'm getting 12,000 back, which you know, what, you know, whatever that is, that's quite a good return. Like in, in that example, is twenty percent. But I said to them, but if 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 the capital, if it's the fact that you don't like the fact that you don't have your money, why why don't you just get a commercial mortgage? And the person was like, oh, I hadn't really thought about that. Now, of course, because we we're in this every single day, Simon and myself, every single day, and we talk to people about this every day, and we listen to things and read things every day, we just take it for granted that other people know that and. And I think although the person was aware, of course, aware of mortgages and things, they would kind of said, well, but, but there's extra fees. And I said, but, you know, because they, they were concerned about paying. Uh, and, and of course, with commercial, there are a lot of fees. So I completely agree because you pay the you pay your own solicitor fees, you pay the bank's solicitor conveyancing fees, you know, you pay everyone's bloody fees. Um, however, if if the you know, so my, my argument is, again, it depends on the individual circumstances, but, you know, if, if it's capital, you can take that capital out and, OK, you're now paying a mortgage, so your profit goes down, but you've got whatever the number is back in your bank account. You know, let's say 65%, you can get 65K out, less all your fees, and you're still making some money. And it was like, oh, OK. So and I thought that, you know, that was another really key moment for me to remember that not everybody, you know, and again, if you started talking to me about... Um, how we start project planning for you know to convert a tower block into residential that had previously been you know offices i, I wouldn't know where to start you know um so it, it's 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 key to to have a think about this stuff before before getting into it yeah yeah and and on the on the note of talking to the right people i think that brings us on to a, a, another topic though another problem that we wanted to mention and we're nearly out of time so i'll just try and mention it quickly and that's around mortgages and ending up on mortgages that are basically too expensive. And this this mm. can come in lots of different forms. So it might be that you're on a fixed rate and you've you've let that revert to standard variable rate. Or maybe you're on a tracker mortgage that was fantastic a few years ago, but now, of course, is not so good with the, the base rate having increased. Or maybe it's because you're on a, a repayment mortgage. Maybe this might be because you've got a a buy to let that used to be your home and then you, you transitioned it over. Or maybe it's because for whatever reason in the past, you actually decided to buy it on a repayment mortgage. But now with mortgages having increased and the, the sort of new strains around that in between rental prices or rent, rents having not quite increased as much, you're now sat there with a mortgage that is just, just costing too much for, for any of these reasons or probably many others as well. And maybe you might have a further complication of feeling trapped in that mortgage because you're you're stuck on a, a, a fixed rate still, but it's repayment or something, and you've got redemption charges if you, you get out of that mortgage early. So I think really the, the, the point I want to make is if you are in a, a difficult mortgage situation, even if you're not sure whether it would be possible to get help or not, talk to a mortgage broker, talk to the appropriate professional, and and they will probably be able to suggest a way out of it. They will at least be able to help you with the calculations to work out whether it would make sense to change from repayment to interest only or to pay early redemption charges if you need to in order to be able to change your mortgage product or to find you a fixed rate again that is much lower than that uh, standard variable rate or tracker rate that you've ended up on. Don't don't just sit there. Don't don't let this problem just carry on. But actually, go out there, find a mortgage broker. There, there's the resident mortgage broker we have on this podcast, Simon Glastonbury. He's very nice, very friendly, happy to talk to people, and 
you can find his his details in past show notes or you can get in touch with us if you want to we'll, we'll connect you but even if you want to choose a different mortgage broker there are lots of them out there and really do have a go and find somebody to talk to because it, it might make a, a huge difference to the profitability of your property portfolio and for me, this all comes back to vision and strategy because the people have, so in terms of details, some people just have a different mindset in terms of debt bad, pay off debt. But equally, some people might come into uh, their property business and just think about, let's say, for legacy or pension. That was another, you know, part of the legacy thing. Oh, I just want a pension, but we haven't defined what that means. And actually have bought, a, you know, if they you know, they've had a, an event, it could be, uh, you know, probate, you know, they could have got inheritance and they thought I'm going to buy some properties just because I want to keep that money safe. And they've bought those properties, buy to let properties in in uh, in advance of that. But they have mortgages on it, but they're repayment because they thought, well, we'll, we'll, we'll let the rents pay that over time. And, and having spoken with people about this, uh, that is fine. And they 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 thought that was the way to go because at the end of the term, hopefully those properties have been paid off and, and now I've got four properties. However, if, if we're looking to develop the business, because some people have had issues with cash flow, and as you know, again, if you've got the wrong mix, if you've got some in personal name and, and some in limited companies, you know, so those are you know, generating rents, but actually getting negative uh, profit because or, you know, they're losing money because of the, the Section 24 stuff. And I, I said, well, look, why, why don't you just look at interest only? And, and they're like, oh, I, had, I just hadn't considered interest only. And I said, look, you know, this is the reasons why, again, it wasn't advice. This is, look, this is why I do it, because I think, okay, in 20 years time, I'm hoping that the property is still going to cover it. But because they were in a situation where the mortgage, the repayment mortgage was, was more than 75% of the rent, um, and that, that just grown over time. Fortunately, they were in a very good um, equity position in, ter in terms of loan to value, but they weren't making any money. In fact, they were losing money because of the mortgage, and it was just that they'd set and forget. So again, it comes back to vision strategy. If I'm if I'm looking to if I want to have some unencumbered properties at the end of it, maybe repayment is the way to go if you're getting a mortgage. But if you're looking for some immediate cash flow, or you know cash flow in the next sort of like two to three years, then interest only would be better because obviously the costs are reduced but so that is why for me it always comes back to knowing where we're trying to get to indeed indeed and where we're trying to get to is the end of this podcast episode i'm afraid <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much for listening i really hope that, that this gives you some food for thought around choosing your vision or setting a new vision and strategy for your property business and we hope that along the way you'll be kind enough to leave us a rating or review for the business of property. And you can always reach us if you have questions or anything else you'd like to talk to us about on show at thebusinessofproperty.com. And Stuart and I will talk to you again next week.